you. You are the first caller to this conference. Please wait while others join. The leader has not activated this conference. Please stand by until your call begins. Ready, Erlen? I'm going to go ahead and then going. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, if if you are new to the meeting, um, we did have our first session yesterday um, from nine till uh, eleven fifteen. So um, I will kind of treat this as you know, as though maybe some of you are new. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alan Barnes. I am the Arizona State Data Center Coordinator for the uh, Arizona State Data Center Network. Our state agency is the Arizona Office of Economic Opportunity and the State Data Center Lead Agency in partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau. It is under the supervision of the Arizona State Demographers Office. And I would like to welcome you all to the second and final session of our Arizona State Data Center Virtual Annual Meeting. Um, as I mentioned in our first session, the Arizona State Data Center is a member network um, of the state and local government organizations, which includes state agencies, state and local libraries, councils of government, and local government planning agencies who uh, use and promote the use of the U.S. Census Bureau data in their uh, daily work and, and throughout their service areas. So for today's session, we will have two presentations. Uh, we will have a presentation of the longitudinal, longitudinal, sorry, longitudinal uh, Employer Household Dynamics Program, also simply known as LEHD. Uh, it will be uh, presented by Ms. Erlene Dell, who is a program analyst for the LEHD program within the Center for Economic Studies at the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, following Ms. Uh, Dowell, we will have uh, a 10-minute uh, break, and then we will uh, we'll follow that break with a presentation uh, by Mr. Andrew Haight, who asked the question, uh, does the Census Bureau have business data? Mr. Haight serves as the data products and data user liaison uh, within the economy-wide statistics division of the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, after these presentations, I will just speak briefly on the state of the state data center program uh, as we move closer to the conclusion of the 2020 census campaign. So before we begin uh, our, first, our uh, first presentation of the day, we want to remind you of the evaluation forms which were distributed with the access information that you received um, in, the, your, in an email. And uh, we'd really appreciate uh, your evaluation and comments to help with uh, the improvement of our meetings in the future. We would also uh, ask that you make sure that your phones are on mute while the presenters are speaking. And lastly, we ask that you not put the meeting on hold uh, in case you, you're in the office and you have one of those telecom systems that has the whole music. So with that, we will um, begin our uh, session today uh, with Ms. Erlene Dowell. Erlene, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share the LEHD products with you. I've been promoting LEHD for over 10 years, and I've witnessed the program grow from two data sets to five, and three data tools to seven. Here is an agenda of how my presentation will be going, starting off with a brief introduction to the LEHD program and its resources for some of you who don't know, and then I'll briefly introduce our products with real examples, and then we'll go over all of our other data sets with quick demos. Unlike the American Community Survey and the Economic Census, the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program is not dependent on survey responders. LEHD is a unique link between employer and employee data for the U.S. 
Of course, you cannot talk about LEHD without talking about the Local Employment Dynamics, or LED, which is a voluntary federal-state partnership that was developed in the 1990s with just a few states. Its main purpose is to merge employee data and employer data to produce a collection of enhanced labor market statistics with state-of-the-art confidentiality protection. Under the partnership, states send their unemployment insurance or UI wage records and their quarterly census of employment wage data or QCAW to us, which then is combined with censuses and surveys to create new dynamic information on workers to produce public use data products as well as microdata for research. The UI records give us jobs data, the QCEW gives us firm data, and our person data comes from censuses and surveys. LEHD has five different data sets with seven applications for easy access to these data sets. Each data set along with each data tool is unique in its own way. If you are curious about employment, hires, separations, turnovers, and earnings, you would look at the Quarterly Workforce Indicators, or QWI, utilizing the QWI Explorer or the LED Extraction Tool. This data set is also accessible through the Census Bureau API. If you want to look at employment for detailed and customized geography, you would look at the LEHD Origin Destination Employee Statistics or Loads data using the On the Map or On the Map for Emergency Management data tool. One sidebar, On the Map for Emergency Management is the only data tool that has population data along with data from other federal agencies within the LEHD program. If you want to look at statistics on job mobility across state boundaries or industries, transitions between jobs by timing and firm or worker characteristics, or earning changes due to job changes, you would use our job to job or J to J flows data using the J to J floor. One of our newer data sets is the post-secondary employment outcomes or PSEO. This experimental data set reports earnings by institution, degree field, degree level, and graduation cohort for one, five, and 10 years after graduation. The current release includes the University of Texas system, public institution in Colorado, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Future releases will include more post-secondary institutions. Finally, we just released our new data set Veterans Employment Outcomes, or VEO. This new experimental data set reports earnings and employment outcomes for U.S. Army veterans one, five, and 10 years after discharge by military occupation, rank, demographics, industry, and geography of employment. Mm -hmm. In addition to the data tools, raw data downloads are available along with LEHD microdata for approved projects through our secure census research data centers. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. On the map for emergency management has named mission, was named mission critical from, by the Department of Commerce. That means if anything should happen, such as a shutdown, the application will continue to be available to the public. On the map for emergency management can be used to assess workforce impacts. It can identify the number and location of effective workers and industries. It can also assess population and housing impacts and identify the number and location of affected residents. It can also be used for emergency preparedness and response planning and answer questions such as where should response efforts concentrate and are there special or vulnerable population segments. It tracks tropical storms and hurricanes, floods, freezing temperatures, and snowfall. All of that data is from NOAA. On the map for emergency management also tracks fires, from the Department of Agriculture and Department of Interior. And finally, disaster declaration areas from FEMA. Combined with census data from ACS, Decennial, and Lowe's. Recently, On the Map for Emergency Management had a small facelift. 
since many of the states were being declared a disaster declaration area due to COVID-19, the blaring orange base was taking over the map shown on the left. We updated the, updated the base to an opaque orange with a choice to click on the type of disaster event the user would like to look at. Here, we can look at VR4524, which is a COVID-19 declaration in Arizona. We can go live. You can Google on the map for emergency management census for easy to remember access, and then click on the link. So I'm going to go ahead and go live. All right. Um, can anybody tell me if we can see my my browser? We can, at least I can. Okay, great. All right, so um, here's the LEHD homepage. Um, if you can remember, lehd.ces.census.gov um, to get to this page, but this is where I'll be working off most of the, most of the um, presentation. So I will click on on the map for emergency management. And then it will bring up the map. And now we're looking at real time. So uh, we can see currently there are a lot of hurricanes happening. Um, there's a lot of disaster declaration and fire. So looking at um, the DR4524, I am going to just type it into the DR dash 4524, and it automatically pops up in a window, and I'll click on that. And then it zooms into Arizona and the um, affected area. So some of the things that we can look at, look at are vulnerabilities, um, such as social vulnerabilities, economic vulnerabilities, and physical vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities for COVID could include age and race, poverty level, and renter-occupied homes. So if I go to the left and I just scroll down a little, I can see disability status um, by poverty status. And if I click on that, and then maybe I want to just look at um, with disability, the map will zoom in to civilian population 18 and, 18 and over for whom poverty status is determined with a disability. You can see the lighter shade are um, zero to four, while the darkest shade is 699 to 3,593. And then the um, chart also updates. So another um, poverty, I mean, another vulnerability could be race. So when uh, COVID first started, we um, were told that the black or African American men were the ones that were mostly infected. So we can see that in this area, in this selected area, there are about 305,259 uh, Black or African American alone. That's not just men, that's everybody. So, uh, and then finally, to look at um, renters, we can go to the decennial topic. So here um, in the left-hand corner, if I click on the arrow, we can look at decennio and the map and the chart updates. And then we can scroll down to see population by housing. So um, it shows renters occupied population. So, you know, this is important for the infected or the impacted area um, because there are people who have lost their jobs. And, and instead of having the mortgage where you can ask your bank to give you um, uh, reprieve to paying your mortgage on time, there's still people that have to rent and they have to, you know, pay their landlords. So these are um, helpful things uh, for people to look at um, the impacted area. You can also click on disaster declaration in blue at the top. 
and um, it's just thinking. Still thinking. Okay. All right, thank you. So, um, and then it'll take you to um, the FEMA disaster declaration page, and it gives you information regarding um, the Arizona COVID-19 pandemic. And then um, it has the financial assistance and then the news releases. Um, but the reason I popped, I mean, I decided to go here is that um, I'm, I've downloaded the Google Earth and I'm um, transitioning into the sister map for on the map for emergency management. So I will go back to the PowerPoint Is everybody still there? Am I still here? I just heard a, a not so good sound, that's why. You're still here. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Super. So um, just give me a moment. I'm just afraid that my laptop will go off. So I'm just going to plug it in just for security reasons. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. So um, over on the FEMA disaster declaration, um, I downloaded the KMZ files uh, ahead of time, and I was able to import them into the sister map on the map. On the map is a web-based mapping and reporting application that shows where workers work and where they live. It provides companion reports on age, earnings, industry, distribution, race, ethnicity, educational attainment, and sex. We have data from 2002 all the way to 2017 for most of the 50 states, including D.C. However, there is no data for Alaska and South Dakota in 2017. And data for 2016-2017 does not include federal data, but will be backfilled hopefully by the end of fall. You can customize the selection area as low as the census block with disclosure protection and input output reports are available. In this screenshot, I've imported the KMZ files for FEMA for the DR4524. Once I've imported the files, I can select all polygons and continue with the selected features. That will bring me to the selection tab where I can confirm selection. And once I confirm, it takes me to the analysis setting where I've chosen to run the area profile. Here we can see over 2 million workers live in the areas deemed as disaster declaration areas. We can also switch from where workers work to where workers live. So if I um, go back to that, and that might take a little bit of time. So um, if we have time, I'll come back to do that one, if anybody wants to see that. So the following um, are examples and ways LEHD has been used to analyze past recessions and the behavior of the workforce. This article talks about how baby boomers are working longer and studies have actually shown in some cases that they are earning more. Some theories about why the elderly are working longer could be to pad their retirement funds or to actually recover from the recession. Using the QWI Explorer, we'll look at earnings and industries for those 65 and above. In this screenshot of the QWI Explorer, we can look at the employment count for 2006 to 2016 for those ages 65 and 99 in Arizona. In 2006, there were 3,898,909 3, sorry, that's 
that's not uh, Arizona. So in so here we're just looking at um, the amount of workers in healthcare and in retail because that's what they said that um, most elderly work in these areas. So let's try let's try to go and um, do that one. So I'm going to go back to the LEHD area, and then I'm going to click on QWI Explorer, and then I will go ahead and under geography level, I'll just enter Arizona. And I'm going to keep it at the indicator at the employee um, beginning of quarter employment count. And then I'm going to go here to the X axis and I'm going to change that to um, make sectors. And then I'm going to change, take the age group out. And then I'm just going to go ahead and check none, but then I will check um, 55, 64, and 65. And then if I just double click on the um, top, it'll show, um, just like the article said, that many of those ages 55 and 64 are going into healthcare and retail trade. So you can see in the state of Arizona, um, those 55 and 64, there are about 67,464, while um, those that are 65 to 99 are 27,445. Okay, going back to the PowerPoint. I'm sorry, it keeps telling me why I'm. Yeah, it's gray hatch, Darlene. Okay. How about now? So great. Looking good. Yeah, you see the PowerPoint? Great. So afraid to get out of that stuff. Ah. Okay, sorry about that. So in another article um, from the Washington Post, the article talked about how many, how men who worked in male-dominated occupations and became unemployed during recessions were more likely to take female-dominated occupations Unemployment seemed to be the trigger for men to consider new alternatives. The study found that the study found during the recession. Who's your fellow students? Um, I'm sorry. Is, can people hear me also? Okay. Yeah, yes. somebody doesn't have their phone yes. muted. Yes, please please put your phone on mute if you're uh, listening to the presenter. Okay. The study found, thank you, the study found during the recession that many men went back to school to earn degrees as nurses and teachers. PSEO, I mean, using the J2J Explorer, we can look at how many male manufacturing workers went into healthcare before the recession at 27.6%. During the recession, 30.5%. And then 10 years after the recession with 42.1%. And this is all out of Arizona. Um, we, can, we can try to do that. Uh, hopefully it'll work.
Okay, great. So here we are back at the LEHD homepage, and I'm going to go ahead and click on J to J Explore. So one of the things about all of our data tools is that it's very intuitive. Um, so if I look at here, guided entry starts here, and it says number one, and we want to look at hires two. So those are the people going into the industry, or we can look at separation from. So I'm going to keep it at hires two because we're interested in those going into um, into healthcare and nursing. So I'll change the state again to Arizona, and just to also let you know that the J to J. Uh, also looks at metro areas, so if you wanted to look at Phoenix or anything else, um, you can do that too. But I'll just keep it at state level. And then I'm going to go ahead and do, um, actually, I'm sorry, we're changing this to uh, separation from, and we're looking at those leaving manufacturing and going into um, another industry. So here, I'll go ahead and click on um, number two, so it highlights blue, this tells me I'm allowed to click on these buttons, so I'll click on which industry. And now we can see those in manufacturing going into um, 20 other different industries. Um, but then I want to just look at just the healthcare and um, education. So I'll go ahead and select none. But then we will look at just healthcare and education because those are the pink colored, as um, the article wrote. And then we're going to change um, the quarter. So I'm going to change it from 2018. And I'm going to go ahead and do before the recession, so 2007, um, during the recession, 2009, and then 10 years after. And 2017, and I'll click set filters. Then I'm going to change the sex to just male. And then to get a better view, we'll look at the bipartite chart. And sorry, I'm just clicking on a lot of buttons, but I'm check, taking out um, the quarter that it had put in, and I'm just putting in um, manufacturing. No, it was supposed to be. All right, 2017, 2009, and 2007. All right, so now we can see those leaving manufacturing and going into educational services, and we can click on percentage so it gives us a better idea. And if I hover over it, you can see how many of them um, from manufacturing went into educational. You can see the different years. Um, and then same with healthcare. So the healthcare, we can see um, what I had said earlier that in 2007 there was 29, but then um, in 2017 there was 37.9%. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. I think I've kind of figured out this jumping back and forth. So um, PSEO is an experimental tabulation that highlights employment and earnings outcomes for college and university graduates. By matching university transcript data with a national database of jobs, PSEO provides annual earnings of graduates in the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile and traces graduate movements from post-secondary institutions 
degree level and degree major to employment by industry and geographic labor markets. Transcript data is provided to, to the Census Bureau by higher education systems and individual colleges and universities through data sharing arrangements with, with the Census Bureau. The current release only includes the University of Texas system, public institutions in Colorado, University of Michigan, and University of Wisconsin-Madison, but future releases will be included, more post-secondary institutions. And just to let you all know, I did um, check on Arizona, and we have an agreement signed, so um, we are just waiting for data now. So it should be soon. Last year, the University of Michigan published an article that highlighted professional service and healthcare as their leading industries of graduates 10 years after receiving a bachelor's degree. The article looked at alumni employment and geographical statistics using the PSEO data from 2001 to 2015. The top industries of their graduates who received bachelor's degrees across all fields for employment after 10 years were professional, scientific, and technical services, healthcare and social assistance, educational services, finance and insurance, and manufacturing. In the article, an example about English majors from the University of Michigan's top industries are education, professional scientific and technical services, information, and healthcare and social assistance. This example mirrors the article. The article also mentioned how many graduates stayed in Michigan and how others left and where they went. The bipartite chart from the PSEO Explorer gives you a data visualization of the article. So if I go live again, And then I will go to PSEO. And then I'm going to click on the flows type for data. And then I'm changing state from Colorado to Michigan. And I'm going to keep it at bachelor's degree, all cohorts. And then I'm going to change um, destination flows to global. And then we'll put in 10 years because that's um, what they looked at. And then just percentage because percentage is always so much easier to look at. And then I'm going to clear the selection because currently, um, as you can see, we're looking at psychology and business management. But I'm going to go ahead and clear the selection. And I'm just going to pick English. So see here, um, so English was the degree program, and after 10 years, um, the, the, the graduates went into educational services, and then professional scientific, healthcare and social services, and then information were the top four. And then we can see um, where they went to. So um, about 29% of them stayed in Michigan while others um, went to the east, north, central um, part, and then mid-Atlantic part and Pacific. If I click on uh, education, then it breaks it down and we can just see educational services and we can see who, went, who stayed in Michigan and went into education and who you know, went to the east, north, central, and so on. Um, we can click on Michigan I apologize, you have to go back to Hello. I think I'm frozen. All right, well, I apologize. It's, it's supposed to click on, this worked a minute ago. So if I click on Michigan, 
And there we can see um, the different industries that had now social science. I apologize that for that. But we can see those that went and got a degree in social science but stayed in Michigan and what industries they went into. So also, if you have any questions, we have um, um, email us here at the top. There's also some tutorials that will walk you through how to. Okay. So um, moving on to the final data tool that we have, uh, this is the Veterans Employment Outcome, and this was released at the beginning of the summer. Uh, the challenges faced by military veterans transitioning into the civilian labor force are a subject of ongoing concern to policymakers. These statistics are generated by linking veteran records provided by the U.S. Army to national administrative data on jobs at the U.S. Census Bureau. Coverage of the data is all enlisted soldiers in the Army who completed their initial term of service and were discharged between 2000 and 2015. There were about 650,000 veterans. Coverage includes Army veterans, labor market outcomes like PSEO for one, five, and 10 years after discharge. By military occupation, rank, demographics such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, education, industry, and geography of employment. Although VEO currently covers only Army veterans, these statistics could potentially be expanded to other service branches. Here's a view of the veterans employment outcome for one year post discharge of earnings for the infantry and armor and amphibious in the 25%, 50%, and 75 percentile. The 25, 50, and 70 per, 75 percentiles are based on performance. Those who are higher performers would make, money, make more money in the 75 percentile for their chosen profession. So for example, uh, looking at the screen, we can see those in the 25 percentile under infantry general is 21,590, while in the 50 percentile is 31,300, and then in the 75 percentile it's 43,980. Here we can look at 10 industries that veterans go into and their earnings per industry for those in the 50 percentile one year after discharge for a timeline of 2000 to 2014. Those who worked in the min mining industry for, from 2012 to 2013 peaked at 80,000, which makes sense because that's when North Dakota had the oil boom. Next was the utilities and information, then finance and insurance, wholesale trade, manufacturing and construction all clustered together. Finally, on this slide, you can look at employment totals and 10 industries veterans went into post one year discharge. In 2000, employment was in the highest with retail trade and manufacturing at the top of the list. Let's try to go live to show how the tool works. All right, so back into my LEHD homepage, clicking on LE, I mean, the VEO um, outcomes, and then this was the screenshot that we looked at earlier. So now I'm going to go ahead and click on Occupation Selected, and we're just going to look at the um, air, air traffic controllers. So once I do that, um, we can see um, in the 75 percentile, those in air traffic controlling uh, make about 61,960 one year um, post discharge. But if we want to look at 10 years, we can click on um, year per discharge, post discharge, and then it put in 10. And now we can see that the air traffic controller uh, makes about 91,270 if 
you are in the 75 percentile. So it's very interesting. You can go ahead and play around. You can click on states, um, and we can look at different states. I still am learning how to use this, so um, here we can see Maryland, um, District of Columbia and Virginia. I know we all would love to see Arizona. So here we can see Arizona um, for veterans. We have those that are um, in the 25 percentile. This is one year. And this is infantry again, but we see that those are making, you know, pretty much across the border, 42,340 if you are in the 75 percentile. So pretty cool stuff. All right, so um, these web-based analyses um, and visualization tools provide accessibility to the data for a wide variety of user needs and levels of statistical expertise. Many of our stakeholders are more likely, likely to use web-based tools than download and manipulate raw data files. Along those same lines, these types of ap applications ease users into sessions of data exploration. Exploring the data is an excellent way to learn the intricacies of the statistics and to discover features that you might not have tested otherwise. Analysis tools also help to provide real-world context for the data by enabling easy comparisons over time, geography, and characteristics. This contextual perspective often comes about when playing with visualization of the data. Visualizations change the way we understand the statistics led directly to greater insight, which can lead to more relevant and impactful storytelling. We, are all, we also use the, these tools to promote our data partnership and products to all stakeholders to expand understanding of our data throughout the federal statistical system. And last but certainly, certainly not least, we build these tools for our state partners. We value our voluntary partners and hope that these tools uh, significantly improve access to LED data and help to streamline data processes in their states. And with that, I thank you for your attention and your time, and we'll open it up to questions now. So if you want to ask questions, just um, take your phone off mute and um, you, can, you can ask uh, early. So do we have any questions? I know we have some questions out there from some folks. We have a lot of uh, folks that work with the economics. I work in population, so we're, we don't do that as much, but um, I think Alan. Uh, hey, Alan, I'll start with a question. This is Jim. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so I heard uh, uh, Arizona has signed the contract. We were uh, in contact with the regents' um, office um, about a year ago, and they said they were going to do this. And uh, can you confirm that um, uh, your, the Census Bureau is, Bureau is still waiting for the data? Uh, you don't have the data yet? So is this regarding the post-secondary employment that, That's correct. The, the higher yeah. education, yeah. So, so no, we, um, so we're working on, yeah, so we don't have the data yet, but we're still working on the contract. So I think we either just sent it back um, to them on September 2nd, or they sent it, yes, I think we just signed it on September 2nd and we're waiting for the final um, approval. Okay. Early. Okay. Do we oh, know? Oh, here it is. Um, I, I found it. So it says um, okay. the PSEO agreement requiring final signature was sent to Arizona State University on September second, twenty twenty. Hopefully, we have all signed agreement any day now. Any day now. There you go. Oh, okay. 
So you're, you're doing this uh, with the individual universities, not the system. In, in Arizona, we have a system of three public universities. They're the region that governs them, but uh, that sounds like you're signing contracts with uh, Arizona State and maybe uh, two other universities individually? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. Erlene, this is Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've got a question regarding the FEMA. When you were showing the, the COVID and then mm -hmm. the FEMA disaster areas, noting that Sally has just, the hurricane has just come in, how long mm -hmm. will it be or is that available, the data for that, where it hit and, and possibly up through? Is it available now or do we have to yes. wait for FEMA? It's it, available now. So, you know, um, we get direct feed from the, from NOAA. And um, so the shapefiles, here, let me just go there. The shapefiles or the wind swaths kind of um, go upon the affected area. So here, um, this is live time. And so when Sally comes, well, Sally's here, he's down there. <laughs> Um, if I double click on it, see, you see on the left side, it says Hurricane Sally here. So I can just click on that. And then, so we have the data because the data is already there. It's, you know, we're just waiting for the impacted areas. So it is, it, it is simultaneous as soon as it's. Yes. It is updated every six hours from um, NOAA. And then for FEMA, um, it does not go to FEMA unless, until it's declared a disaster declaration area. So um, I would guess that they're gonna wait maybe a day or two. And then when, when the president decides it's a disaster declaration area, then it'll go into the FEMA data. That's really neat. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for early? Okay, well, if we don't have any uh, other questions, uh, I just want to know, let everyone know that if you do um, think of something later, um, you can contact me um, and I will I can uh, get that question to Erlene and uh, she can, uh, you know, get that so we can get an answer for your question. Um, so I think since we're a little bit early, um, we can go ahead and take our 10 minute break and um, start back right at 10 o'clock since it's 9.50 our time. Um, and we will do that, and we'll come back with Andy Haight. But before we do that, Erlene, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. And, um, you know, thank you. And uh, thanks for uh, supporting our network. Thank you so much, Ellen. And uh, I hope that everybody um, found the data tools useful. So just reach out to me if you need any assistance on learning any of the data tools. Okay. Okay, so at this time, we'll go ahead and we'll take our break and we'll start back at 10 o'clock. So we'll see you back here at 10 o'clock. Thanks, everyone. Okay, do you need anything more from me? Well, we always need okay. more from you, but <laughs> at this moment in time, no. Thank you very, very yeah, much for presenting for us. It was my pleasure. Thanks. And I'm Thanks. so. So glad it all worked out with the yes. back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. We got it down. Okay. It's always a hit or miss, but yay, hit. Okay. So um, thanks again. You guys have a wonderful day. You too. You too. Thank Take care. you. You too. Bye bye. 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 And Andy is here, I trust. Yes, I am.
How are you, Al? He is. How are you doing? Very good. How are you? Good. Are you seeing, seeing my screen? Yes, I yes. I am seeing your screen. Okay, good. I passed the advanced class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So hopefully we'll have a few more questions with the economic census data and, and all those products. Andy, are you going to go live? Yes. You might want to try that right now. We had a little bit of a problem with Erlene's. Okay. Let me, uh, let's try that. Are you seeing uh, census.gov? We sure are. Yes. Yes. Wow. I passed the advanced class, the, the super advanced class. <laughs> you would get a gold <laughs> star today. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. It doesn't take a lot to get a gold star anymore these days, does it? <laughs> <laughs> On a webinar, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, see. If you and I haven't figured out WebEx by now, we never will. <laughs> yeah, but it's not us. It's the traffic on the Internet, you yeah, know, slowing things true. down. And that that's what I think happened with Orleans to begin with. We had that had a problem where we were getting that gray hatch mark screen. Oh, uh, okay. That's why I wanted you to test it out to see if we had to go through a different route to get you there. You know, right. yeah, you and I know all the back the back doors to how to get around yeah. things within this. So she you know, she periodically has um internet issues based upon where she lives. You know, her her house is in a is in a more rural area of Maryland and she sometimes has connectivity problems at, at home. So not that our internet is perfect here, um at, at my house, but it may be better um, and actually, I have the house to myself uh, this afternoon, Barb. Um, my, everybody is gone except for me and the and the cat. So uh, no one else is on there hogging up the internet, watching videos, or doing other things. So uh -huh. I, may, I may be lucky out here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, yesterday mine was running so slow. I mean, trying to open an email was like having a tooth pulled, you know? I mean, it was like, come on. It was that. But today it's running fine. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. My phone cut out on me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that happened to us yesterday, too, Alan. Remember both of us? Yeah. I think mine does at least once any time I do this type of stuff, so... Okay, just let me know when it's going, and we'll get Go started. ahead. Okay. So um, I hope everyone had a good break. We're back. <laughs> um, we are now going to hear from uh, Mr. Uh, Andy Haight, who um, is the, who, as I said before, uh, is the Products and Data User Liaison within the Economy-Wide Statistics Division of the U.S. Census Bureau, and he's going to answer the question, does the Census Bureau have business data? Andrew, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Alan. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy days uh, to attend the session. Um, I keep saying good afternoon. I was going to say good afternoon, but no, it's morning for you guys. So um, as Alan said, I'm Andy Haight, um, economist at the Census Bureau. been at the Bureau for a little over 30 years, um, and I've spent my entire career working in that part of the Census Bureau that you know exists. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the economic census. I'm going to be giving you all an update on where we are with releasing data from the economic census. And then we'll talk a bit at the end about the COVID-related resources that are available. 
I'm sure you all are sick and tired of hearing the, the, the acronym COVID. Um, it's been part of my lexicon for so many months now that I just sort of roll it off, right off my tongue. So to get us started, I just want to provide a little bit of context about the Census Bureau. Um, you would have to be living under a rock to not know that we are conducting the population census right now. But as important as that program is, it is just one of more than 130 different things that we do each and every year. Um, those 130 programs include demographic programs like the Decennial Census and the American Community Survey that I'm sure many of you are well familiar with, but it also includes 58 business programs a side of the Census Bureau that many people don't realize exist. Those 58 surveys of uh, programs that we conduct can be grouped into three broad categories. And I have repurposed this slide dozens, if not hundreds of times. I just love it um, because I think a pyramid does a really nice job of explaining and, and sort of visualizing not only the relationship from each of these types of programs to each other, but also gives a hint at the content, the, the amount of detail that is shown. At the very top of the pyramid is our monthly and quarterly surveys. The Census Bureau conducts 17 of the 22 leading economic indicator surveys that you hear about on the evening news. So if you're sitting at home uh, tonight and the reporter comes on and says, the Commerce Department announced today that monthly retail sales for automobiles last month were X number of dollars. I want you to say phooey. Um, yes, we are an agency of the Department of Commerce, but the Census Bureau actually does that monthly retail sales report. These monthly and quarterly surveys are by far the most timely thing that we do in the economic directorate at Census but they are the least detailed. With only two exceptions, these monthly and quarterly surveys only show data at the national and state, uh, excuse me, at the national level. There are only two that produce monthly data at something below the national level. Um, those are our building permits survey. Every month we conduct a survey that publishes data on new residential building permits. Um, and those data are, are produced at the county and even city level. So if Maricopa County issues building permits uh, for new homes, we publish data for Maricopa County. If the city of Phoenix issued their own building permits, we would publish data for the city of Phoenix. The other program, uh, the other monthly survey that produces local area data is our international trade data. Every month we publish information on imports and exports. The data are published by commodity, by mode of import or export, and by country of origination and destination. Um, the data are also published down to the port level. And I always remind folks, port does not just mean water. Uh, airports also qualify. So if you wanted to know how many electronic devices were exported out of the airport in Phoenix, um, out of Phoenix International, we would have that data available. Um, the second tier of the pyramid is our annual programs. Uh, we do 20 annual surveys, some that cover individual sectors of the U.S. economy, like the annual survey of manufacturers, and some that cover all sectors of the U.S. economy, like county business patterns. These annual programs are not quite as timely, of course, as the monthly and quarterlies, but they are much more detailed in terms of industry coverage and in terms of geography. So county business patterns, for example, publishes data every single year by detailed industry down to the county and even the zip code level. But at the bottom of the pyramid, is our sort of most important economic program, and that is the economic census. We do an economic census every five years, the years ending with two and seven. So right now we are releasing the data for the 2017 economic census. The 2022 econ census will be the next one. And these, this program is not only our most detailed program, our most comprehensive program in terms of the industry and the other data variables that are published, 
but it also serves as the baseline or the benchmark for nearly all of our monthly and quarterly surveys and our annual programs. It would be extraordinarily difficult to conduct a monthly survey, a monthly sample survey, if you didn't have a complete universe of all the businesses to sample from. And that's what the economic census serves to do. Now, in terms of the detail that is published in the econ census, this slide gives you sort of an overview of what I mean by detail. The econ census is our most detailed program in terms of the industry coverage. We publish data for nearly every two through six digit NAICS code, the North American Industry Classification System codes. There are a couple of exclusions. We don't cover agriculture because USDA does. And there's a few other ones as well. It is also our most detailed program in terms of geography. The economic census publishes data all the way down to the place level. Place is the term that we use to talk about cities, towns, villages, and boroughs. And those would include not only incorporated cities like the city of Phoenix, but would also include unincorporated areas or what the Census Bureau calls census designated places. We recognize in the economic census all places that have at least 2,500 population. But I do want to make a sidebar note right now that whether we recognize that geography is different from whether we publish data for that geography. All of the business data we publish at the Census Bureau is subject to Title 13 regulations, which basically means that we are uh, required to protect the privacy of individual businesses. Uh, for example, let's say Alan and I uh, owned the only two grocery stores in the town that we live in. The Census Bureau could not publish data on grocery stores in our town because Alan could easily subtract his employment, his payroll, his sales, and his other data from the published total and know exactly what a cheapskate I am, would know exactly how many employees I have, what I pay them, and what my revenues are, my sales are of my grocery store. That would be a clear violation of my privacy, so we don't do that. And this census, we have had some pretty substantial changes in our privacy protection rules. Some of you have heard of something called differential privacy that is being utilized on our demographic programs. In fact, I think you're going to have a presenter, uh, either already have had a presenter or will be having a presenter that's going to talk about differential privacy. We didn't implement differential privacy in the economic census, but we have something that feels a lot like it. Um, in addition to industry and geography, the econ census is also our most detailed program in terms of the other dimensions that are published. We have detailed data broken out by four different types of business size breakouts, employment size and revenue size, and establishment size and firm size. There's the legal form of organization data, what we call LFO data, how many corporations versus partnerships versus proprietorships there are, and even data on franchise status. The census is also our most detailed program in terms of the data variables that are shown in the economic census. We consistently publish across all sectors four basic data variables, number of establishments, employment, payroll, and some measure of output, whether it's sales, shipments, receipts, or revenues. But we also then have over 200 sector-specific variables. So for example, in manufacturing, we publish detailed data on inventories and capital expenditures and assets and depreciation and purchase services is just an amazing wealth of data. The econ census is also pretty unique in that we publish what we call product lines data. Product lines allow users to understand the detailed products and services that businesses provide. So for example, in our, in our example of Alan and I owning the only two grocery stores in our little town, Census would not only publish data on our total sales, but they would also then break out how much of my grocery sales are for produce, are for baked goods, poultry, beef, you know, canned corn, you know, et cetera. There's a, a detailed breakout for grocery stores, and those products are tailored to each specific industry. So the questions we ask a grocery store are very different than the questions we ask a doctor's office. Um, these data are all being released for the first time 
on our new data.census.gov platform. I know that you guys are also getting a presentation on, our, on, the, on that particular platform, but I'll also mention that the data are released in other formats as well. Now at the very bottom of this slide is a brief mention of a survey called the Survey of Business Owners and something called the Annual Survey of Entrepreneurs. Uh, SBO was a survey that we used to do every five years on the same years as we conduct the, the economic census that published information on the race, ethnicity, gender, and veteran status of the business owner. So if you wanted to know something about the number of Hispanic-owned businesses or women-owned businesses or veteran-owned businesses in Arizona, um, down to metros and down to counties, those data were available in SBO. People loved that program, but they always groaned that it was only available every five years. They wanted it more frequently. So we temporarily created a survey called the Annual Survey of Entrepreneurs that gives annual data similar to what's published in SBO. In just a few minutes, you'll be seeing a slide about the replacement for both SBO and ASC, something called the Annual Business Survey. Now, this slide provides a little bit of information, sort of a glimpse into the release schedule for the economic census. Um, as you can see on the slide, we started releasing data from the economic census in September of last year, and we will continue all the way through September of next year. Now, some of you may be saying, what gives, Andy? You know, you're publishing 2017 economic census data in 2020. So we are about nine months in total behind where we would have been at the same time during the 2012 economic census. And that nine month delay is primarily due to two factors. Uh, first, uh, at a very critical time in the collection act process of the economic census, we had some major budget cuts at the Census Bureau that caused us to delay the mail out of the economic census forms um, to by, by almost four months. And then just when we finally got our act back together again and started working, we had a government shutdown and that added another four or five months to our delay. So we are a bit behind. Uh, we have caught up some. Uh, you may have noticed on this slide that the geographic area statistics, the data that publishes information for the state and county and local areas was scheduled to be completed in November. We actually finished it on August 20th. So I'm really happy that our subject matter folks got, got moving on that and got that done so quickly. Now, this slide uh, talks about those local area reports or what we call the geographic area statistics reports. As you may have noticed on that previous slide, we started releasing those in January. They were just completed in August. And during that flow, users often asked, well, Andy, what data have been released already? Has the data for my state, for Arizona, for my sector, has it been released yet? So we created a little visualization out on our website. I've provided the link to it here um, that shows a little hex map of every state in the nation. And it allows you to go in and check by sector whether or not the data that you're interested in has been released yet. Now, as you can tell on this screenshot here, we completed it. It's now 100%. But this visualization is still nice because if I was interested in looking at a particular sector for Arizona, let's say I wanted to pull the data from the economic census for manufacturing in Arizona, I could choose manufacturing from the sector menu at the top of the visualization, and I could then click on the little hex for Arizona. When I then did that, I would get a pop-up box, and in that pop-up box would be a link. If I click on that link, it brings me right to the data on manufacturing in Arizona in data.census.gov. So it's a really nice shortcut to get right to the economic census data without having to go through any of those menus that um, may be giving people some challenges right now. So we're gonna leave this visualization up uh, for quite some time because we know that people really like using this as a shortcut to get to the data. Now, 
When we do the consensus, um, we bundle up all of the changes that have occurred in the five-year period between the previous e consensus and the current one. And those changes are in a couple of categories. The first of them is geographies. As many of you already know, the boundaries of counties, cities, metropolitan areas are not static. They change over time. So when users are comparing data from the 2017 economic census to the 2012 economic census, knowing whether or not that geography, that county, that city, that metro area is the same in 2012 as it is in 2017 is really important. And this is going to be my moment to get on my soapbox and say that any time any of you are making any type of time series comparison of data, not only from the Census Bureau, but from other sources too, when you are doing that time series comparison, you really need to make sure the thing you're comparing is comparable. Um, because geography changes, we provide resources, change notes, reference maps, and other kind of things that users can do to understand whether or not the geography that they're considering comparing has changed, and then let's them make the decision themselves whether or not that change for their purposes is significant or not. For example, the town that I live in here in Maryland annexed some neighboring land that was in an unincorporated area. The boundaries of Crofton, Maryland changed. And when those boundaries changed, those, that new land that was added doesn't have any houses in it. There are no houses in that land. So from a demographic perspective, that boundary change had zero impact on the comparability of the demographic data for Crofton, Maryland. But in that land are about 40 businesses that have been there for 20, 30 years, but just were never part of Crofton, Maryland. So if you were to now to compare the data for 2012 to 2017, you would now be including 40 more businesses that were previously there, but just weren't included in the data. And that might actually make you think that the economy of, our, of my town has grown when in fact that growth is a segment of the boundary change. So I provided a link to these resources here, and I would encourage you all to bookmark that, and anytime you're doing any kind of time series comparison, check these so you can go in and determine, is the thing I'm trying to compare comparable? The second type of change uh, that we implement in the economic census is a change to the classification system itself. The NAICS codes change every five years, the same years as we do the econ census. And in just a moment, you'll see a couple of slides that highlight the major changes to NAICS for 2017. Those product data that I mentioned before that are unique to the econ census, they are now being published for the very first time using something called the NAPS codes, the North American Product Classification System. This will be a completely different way of looking at those products data, and I'll provide a little bit more information about that in just a moment. And then finally, we have a few other changes. There's some changes to our miscellaneous subjects tables. We have the new dissemination platform, data.census.gov, and as I mentioned, we have these new disclosure rules. My tip for you all, or my general statement for Arizona about these new disclosure rules, is that the impact of those disclosure rules is not uniform across the entire state. Your larger counties, your larger metropolitan areas, the counties that have more population and more businesses will be impacted less by these new disclosure rules because there's more businesses in those, in those areas. Maricopa County is going to have a fairly limited amount of impact because there's so much business activity in the county. But some of your other more rural counties, you will definitely notice an impact on the data that's being shown because of these new disclosure rules. This is sort of the bummer portion of my presentation, but I kind of feel like I really need to uh, let you guys know about this because when you start looking at the data, you're going to say, hey, you know, I used to be able to get retail data for my small rural county in Arizona, and now I'm seeing a lot of that data is now missing what, what happened. Now, these next two slides provide a little bit of information about those NAICS changes. 
there are only six sectors that were impacted by these NAICS changes. And I would encourage you all to check out the NAICS website. I have provided a link to it in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide. Uh, but these two slides just give you a quick visualization on what those changes are. You can see there were some changes in the mining sector and in the manufacturing sector. For example, in manufacturing, we used to collect four separate NAICS codes for household cooking, refrigeration, laundry, and other household appliances. Those four industries have now been combined into one NAICS code for major household appliance manufacturers. So if I was interested in that particular industry in Arizona, um, I would have to know that I'm not going to find those four old codes in the 2017 econ census. It's now this one new code. Retail also had uh, some changes. And then the last three sectors are the information sector, real estate, and professional scientific and technical services. My Andy's major fun, fun with crayons here, the blue highlighted uh, rows are ones where the code changed but where there was no content change. So if you were interested in researching the formal wear or costume rental industry in Arizona, the 2012 NAICS code is now different for 2017, but there's been no content change. The green highlighted ones are those combo cases, like that, like that appliances one we just talked about. In the information sector, record production and integrated record production and distribution have been consolidated into one NAICS code. The professional scientific and technical services sector is the only sector that truly has a brand new industry, an industry that did not exist prior to 2017 that now has its own NAICS code, and that is research and development in nanotechnology. That industry um, has been growing and has now grown to the point that we can now actually collect detailed data on this industry across the nation and by geography, including Arizona, by the way. Um, I did not know that this was an industry that was, um, that was a around in Arizona, uh, but it is. So this, for the first time, we'll have data on nanotechnology. Now, as I mentioned, um, the FMX Census data are available in a couple of different platforms. Data.census.gov is our primary platform, but we've also just recently added the data to QuickFacts, and it was also just added to Census Business Builder version 3.1, uh, which was just released a couple of months ago. Uh, we will be updating CBB in October and then again in December. Um, I'm not going to get a chance to demo it for you today, but if you haven't had a chance to check out that data tool, I would really encourage you all to do so. So to close out my econ census portion of the presentation, let's talk about what's coming after geographic area data. In November, we'll be releasing those NAPS data, those product data, and I have provided a link to our NAPS website where you can go in and see what those new NAPS products are going to look like. In November, we will also start releasing those size-based tables, and we will also start releasing the miscellaneous subjects tables. So, and that will then be closed out in September of next year. So, let's now change gears and talk about some other things. I mentioned a moment ago that we used to publish something called the Survey of Business Owners, SBO. It's a great program, published information on race, ethnicity, gender, and veteran status. People loved it, and they hated it because it was only available every five years. ABS is now the replacement for the survey of business owners. And there's a couple of things that I need to make you aware of. First, while the content that is published is similar to what was published in the SBO and the Annual Survey Entrepreneurs, the level of geography and industry detail that is published is a little different. We do have data at the county, metro, and place levels, but it is only available by two-digit NAICS. So you're going to get information on Hispanic-owned manufacturers in Arizona, but you're not going to get data on Hispanic-owned pet food manufacturers in Arizona. Those more detailed industries are only available in, in ABS at the national and state levels. The other big difference, and this is really the big, big difference, is that the ABS only covers employer businesses, businesses with paid employees. 
the SBO used to cover data for both employers and what we call non-employers, uh, but those non-employer data were dropped from the ASC and they have not yet been restored in the ABS. There are plans to expand the ABS to include non-employer businesses again, because there is definitely a recognition that there are a lot of minority and women-owned businesses that are not employer businesses, and so there's a real interest in having data on that. It's just we're not there quite yet. Now, the next three slides I'm going to talk about has to do with COVID. Um, as we were entering the pandemic, the Census Bureau started realizing that not only was our demographic data going to be important to understand the potential impacts of COVID, but so would our business data. And one of the first indications we started receiving that there was an impact to business due to COVID was from business formations. Um, businesses who have approached the IRS and said, I'm getting ready to, to start up my business and I need an employer identification number. We started noticing, even as early as February, a slight decline in the number of business applications. We get uh, data files every single month from the IRS of people who have requested an employer identification number who have applied to be a business through the IRS. And historically, we've taken those applications and we've bundled them up and published the data annually. But what we did this time was we took those regular updates and we are now publishing a weekly data series on business formations. Uh, so business formation statistics has been around for a long time, but now it's publishing data weekly. As you can see on the slide on the right-hand side, the data are being published at the state and regional level, um, and they are being broken out by type of business, uh, type of application. So you can go in and actually see how our startups being impacted by COVID. Uh, this slide that I have here is pretty, er, uh, pretty old. It's from week 20 of 2020, where we still were seeing major negative impacts in Louisiana and, and Alabama um, on, the, on, on that particular industry, or excuse me, Louisiana and Mississippi on, 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 on applications. If you were to look at the data recently, you'll see that startups are starting to really kind of kick back off again. So I've provided links to this program. I would encourage you all to check it out. The second thing we then did was we said, well, not only are startups being impacted, but we know existing businesses are being impacted as well. We knew that certainly there were larger businesses that were being impacted, but those larger businesses tend to be pre pretty well represented in our monthly and quarterly surveys. Um, so just looking at the revenue or sales data, for example, in monthly retail sales, you could see how the retail industry or how the food services industry at the national level um, for the larger businesses is being impacted. But we also then recognized that small businesses were also going to be impacted. So we actually stood up in record time um, a brand new survey called the Small Business Pulse Survey. Um, this survey ran for nine weeks, um, starting in early April and continuing through August, uh, ran, through, ran for nine weeks. We then took a pause, and we have now started up phase two of the Small Business Pulse Survey. And what it does is it measures the impact to small businesses of COVID. Um, it asks them overall questions, like overall, how are you impacted? But it even asks them detailed questions about their cash flow, about their any loan defaults that you know, they've had to not pay, et cetera. The data are shown at the, at the national and state level, and it is broken out by sector of the U.S. economy. So on the right-hand side, you can see that NAICS 72, the second to last bar, is the one that has had the largest negative impact. Um, NAICS 72 is a combination in food services, so that's hotels and restaurants. Um, no surprise, substantially impacted. Um, what I thought was sort of fascinating was that NAICS 22, the utilities sector, and NAICS 52, the financial insurance sector, have, been, have had the least impact. 
I guess in a way we want to be happy that our local utility company has been able to keep producing electricity during heat of the summertime and not be impacted by COVID. Um, same thing for banking, um, that they, the banks were able to stay open and keep functioning. Um, but again, it's sort of alarming to see how other sectors have been impacted. The next program that I want to quickly talk about is a household pulse survey. Not only did we stand up a survey of small businesses to understand how they were being impacted, but we also stood up a survey on how households were being impacted. Now, this survey lagged the small business pulse survey a little bit, and they are currently right now working on a phase two. They haven't yet started it, uh, but this is a really interesting program to, again, look at data on how people are being impacted, how households are being impacted by COVID. Um, it's probably hard to read, but some of the questions that are asked in this survey not only cover things like how have your household uh, been affected in terms of loss in employment income, but it even asks them questions about food scarcity. Uh, have you experienced any food scarcity uh, due to COVID? Have you had to delay medical care maybe because your doctor's office was closed and you couldn't get in to see an appointment? Have you experienced any kind of housing insecurity where you've either um, not been able to pay your mortgage or have been not been able to pay your rent because of COVID, um, et cetera? So it's a really fascinating program. Because there are more people in the United States than there are businesses, this survey shows data not only at the state level but also by metropolitan area. So you will be able to get data specifically for the Phoenix Metro and the Tucson Metro um, in, the, in this particular survey. Now, to get access to all of this data, we realized that expecting sort of non-traditional Census Bureau users to access these data might be more than we should expect them to be able to do and that perhaps it would be very useful for us to create a new platform where we would store all of these new programs related to COVID so people could go to one place and understand what the potential impacts of their local community is of, on, by, because of COVID. What we came up with is something called the COVID-19 resource page and the COVID-19 hub. And what you're looking at on the screen right now are screenshots of just two parts of the COVID-19 hub. I'm going to very quickly get out of here and go live so you can actually see this COVID-19 hub um, in person. So to get to the COVID hub, uh, you will now have to scroll down a little bit because we've had some other surveys that have come along. But if you scroll down, you'll eventually get to this part of the site where you can click on the infamous uh, coronavirus picture, um, and that'll bring you to our COVID-19 resource page. On this page, we have links to the COVID-19 hub, which I'll be going to in a minute, but we also have links to the different programs that provide economic and demographic data, and even a link to Census Business Builder, as well as some other resources that are available to help people understand the potential impacts of COVID-19 on their local communities. When you click on the COVID-19 hub, you come to the main COVID-19 hub page. At the very top, we have some basic statistics on the total population, uninsured population, and the number of employer and non-employer businesses. And when I then scroll down, I come to the very first main part of the hub, which is our impact report. Now you can see it automatically defaults to, to New York since that was sort of the epicenter of COVID, but I can easily change my state to Arizona and this platform is now gonna refresh and is gonna show me demographic data from the American Community Survey and economic data from two of our economic programs about people that are potentially being impacted by COVID-19. This is a two page report the first page has the economic and the demographic data together. The second page is all ACS data, is all demographic data. Now, you can see this is showing data at the state level, but I can actually go over here and choose a particular county. I'm gonna cheat and go to an easy one, Maricopa County, um, and actually be able to pull that up. 
And if you really want to see it even better, you can open it up in its own little dashboard. So now we're actually going to be seeing full screen that impact report specifically for Maricopa County. Now, these reports are all fully manipulable. I can click on individual sections of the report and actually browse the data in more detail. I can filter it. I can download the data from here. It's just a nice way to be able to get to it. So that's the first part of the COVID hub. Below there are then those four surveys that we specifically stood up just for measuring COVID-19. The first two, Business Format Statistics and Small Business Pulse Survey, are ones that we just talked about. These ones have their own dashboard built right into this COVID hub. So if I wanted to go in and look specifically at the Small Business Pulse Survey, I can go ahead and click on that. And now I'm going to be able to get that detailed information at the national, state, and metro area from the Small Business Pulse Survey. So if I now let's go ahead and look at states, I can go ahead and change that and I can go ahead and look at data specifically for Arizona and for your neighboring states as well, um, simply by, by choosing a state from the map or choosing a state from the, from the uh, particular metro area or from the, from the menu over here. So let's go ahead and choose Arizona. And the application is now going to allow me to look at how many, um, how, what percentage of the businesses in Arizona have been greatly affected uh, by the COVID pandemic um, and how has that been changing? You can see Arizona was uh, seeing a decline um, and then saw an increase. This platform will incorporate the phase two data um, and that's actually coming in version 1.5. So that's this section. The Household Pulse Survey right now, if I were to click on these two links here or the GoTo link, that would bring me to the Household Pulse Survey page. We haven't yet built a specific uh, dashboard within the COVID-19 hub for the Household Pulse Survey, but it is actually something we're working on. And Community Resilience Estimates is actually a pretty fascinating program that uses data from the American Community Survey to understand how our communities um, coping and dealing with all kinds of shocks, not just COVID. Um, and it allows users to look at risk factors and determine at down to the track level how resilient their community is. Below these four panels are then what we call our policy maps. There are eight of them. And this, this mapping uh, site lets me go in and browse additional data about the impacts of COVID. So let's just say I want to look at poverty status, and I want to specifically zoom in on the state of Arizona. I can now zoom in, and as I zoom in on the map, I'm going to start to see county-level data, and this is now going to allow me to look at county-level poverty information. All of the data that's available in these maps is downloadable, and for those of you who are GIS experts, we can actually, you can actually act you can actually download all of the shape files and all of the data layers to build it into your own particular mapping application. Below here um, are some other downloadable resources that were created. These highlighted data sets uh, give users access to additional statistics that are available in both reference layers and in data files from the American Community Survey and a couple from county business patterns and non-employer statistics. And then finally, at the very bottom of the page is our categorical data set searches that give even more access to this data in Excel file format. So for those of you who want to be able to access this data and pull it down into your own platforms, you can do that. And then there's a few other things here at the bottom. We've got links to some other Census Bureau resources, um, et cetera. Let me go back over to my PowerPoint presentation and just sort of close out uh, where we are. So the economic census, um, as you can probably tell, provides an amazing wealth of business data. Um, lots of data have been released already. There's much more coming. I've provided a link to the releases page so you can see what's coming next and be able to get to that data once it's been released. Um, when you are doing comparisons over time, please, please, please make sure the thing that you're comparing is comparable. That's true for geography and for industry. 
So again, use those resources that we have available, those geographic notes and these NAICS uh, reference files to understand those changes. Data.census.gov is going to be, from here on out, our primary data dissemination tool, not only for the economic census, but also for many of our other economic programs. Um, so those of you who are sort of bemoaning the loss of American Fact Finder, um, unfortunately, you're going to have to get over it um, and just learn how to use this. I will tell you, having been at the Bureau for a long time, that what data.census.gov is doing right now reminds me a little bit of what American Fact Finder was like in 1997 when it was first born. Um, but I will tell you that I have great hopes for what this platform will be in the future. There are many things that you will be able to do in data.census.gov that you could never do before under the old American Fact Finder um, application. Uh, there is much more account census data coming. And again, just to kind of close out, um, these COVID resources um, are there for you to kind of understand the potential impacts of the pandemic on people and businesses in your communities. Um, we very much would appreciate any feedback that you all can provide on these programs. Um, in my 33 years at the Census Bureau, I have never seen us stand up a survey as quickly as we did these COVID platforms. From the initial ideation to when we started publishing data was not even three months, which is a blink of an eye in normal census land. Um, I've never seen us get a survey, which really speaks to not only how important we realized that this all was, but also how other federal partners, including the Office of Office of Management and Budget realized that getting really timely data that helped under, help policymakers decide and understand where, um, where the, our area is being impacted uh, was very important. So with that, I am now done. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for me to take some questions. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? Are we sure we don't have any questions? Or remember, you could put your phone off mute and you can just speak. There we go. You have a question? Go ahead. Do you have a question? Hey, Alan. Okay. If nobody wants to start, I'll do it again. This is Jim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there always has um, to be one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I was waiting for other people to ask questions. Uh, hey, Andy, thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, about uh, the, the COVID portal, um, so the ACS is going to be releasing the new uh, one-year data. I, I know, I understand that uh, I think you are using uh, five-year data for the uh, COVID um, report. Uh, for the state level, do you know if they ever t uh, thought about the one-year data? Because if you look at Arizona, um, the, the first one, the population is 6.9 million, and we know our population for 2019, I estimated, was 7.2 million. So when we present uh, this heat to our big boss, and he, like, he knows the population is 7.2, and we give her a heat that says uh, 6.9, she's like, what, why is this? And then, you know, we try to explain. But uh, did uh, the Census Bureau even consider using the most current statistics, at least for the state level, for this report? Yeah, so a uh, great question. Um, short answer is yes, we very much did consider it. Um, and what really drove the decision to use the five-year estimates throughout the COVID hub was, the, was a concern was raised that if we showed one-year estimates at the state level, but then had to use five-year estimates when we drilled down to counties and places and zip codes and tracks, that that mishmash of one-year and five-year data would be bad, would, would be hard for users to understand because they would never 
the counties would not then match, the sum of the counties would not then match the one-year data shown at the state level. So we decided to do it that way, but I will tell you, um, you are not the only person who has asked that question, and I suspect that what may end up happening, um, and I will say I'm on the team that's building this tool, so I, you're, you, got, you got the right person on the, on the phone. Um, I suspect that we may actually allow users to make the choice themselves, that we'll actually have a toggle um, in the dashboard, in, in the hub, that allows you to toggle between the one-year and five-year estimates, specifically for the reason that you just that you just said. When you have a state that's growing at the rapid rate, the way that Arizona is, um, five-year estimates it just it smooths out that change over that five-year period. You don't see that most recent increase, um, and so what I'll think will probably happen is the tool will default to the five-year estimates, but the user will be able to change it to the one-year estimates, and when they make that selection, all the data will then show the one-year estimates, which will then, of course, mean that some counties in some states will not qualify for the one-year estimates. Um, half of New Mexico is going to disappear from the map because though their counties have less than 65,000 population, I think there's a number of counties in Arizona that's like that as well. Um, so, I suspect that that's what that is what we're going to do. So, yeah, gr great question. Thank you for asking it. I, I always when, when we hear one or two people asking for something, I'm like, okay, it's just them. They're just being difficult. But when I hear 50 people asking it for it, including you, then I feel much better about making that change. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is more uh, partly to uh, appease our uh, our boss, you know, who um, pays attention to this and they they want the current numbers. So, right. And either right. way, it's uh, either way it can cause some confusion because if you don't have the current numbers in, you know, when we know it's 7.2, you'll give us 6.9. That can confuse people. But when you switch from one year to five year, that can also confuse people. So there is no perfect solution. And, um, that that yeah. is for sure. That is for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. This is Sean Neidorf. I work with Jim, and I have a question. Yeah. So you guys have just put out your median household income from CPS. Yep. And now you're about to put it out from ACS, right on the heels of the other one. What this creates for us every year is massive media confusion. <laughs> <laughs> because they sometimes interpret it as change. They sometimes interpret it as, why did this happen? Poor Jim has spent so much time trying to explain this to folks who just are not getting it and then write stories that are just cringe-worthily, I don't even say that right, they're bad, <laughs> you know, because they're, they're conflating these things. Why do you guys time it like this? So... The, 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 the median household income is not the only statistic that we publish at the Census Bureau that is published in more than one program. And in my 33 years at Census, I have asked that same question, why do we publish the same basic statistic in multiple surveys? And the answer I always get is that each of those surveys does something different that makes that number not the same number across surveys, and where that difference is something that is important. That, so for example, um, just to pick on a program that I work on on the, on the economic side, we publish number of businesses in county business patterns, and we publish number of businesses in the economic census. The numbers never match. And I'm always like, well, why the heck do we do the do the county business pattern program in the years as we do the economic census because people will then call and say, Andy, I just was looking at your data and in Maricopa County, count, uh, county business pattern says there's 2,627 restaurants and in the other program it says there's 2,412 restaurants, which is the right number. Um, but what we do then come back and say is, well, county business patterns is a administrative survey. So how we collect the data is a different way. It's an annual program. So if you want to compare data year after year after year, you want to use the same program. The timing of the release of those surveys compounds that confusion. And I will tell you, I have heard your comment before about 
the timing of this. I think no matter when we release them, whether they're released on the same day or on different days, there's going to be confusion. And that's as much our um, challenge of figuring out how do we explain to users why is the median household income in one program different than the median household income in another program? Um, there's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, I don't, I don't have a really good answer for you. Um, we struggle with that a lot. Um, again, it's, it's a question about comparability of data across programs um, and the sampling methodologies and how we conduct the surveys. It's, it's just different. So I don't, I don't know if that. Well, see, now you need a joint press topic. release so you can have a compare contrast in the same document. If you need this, okay. use this one. If you need that, use yeah. this one. And we've had, there are some of the sort of compare and contrast, like we'll get users that will say, I'm looking at the, uh, the um, population estimates program and I'm looking at the American Community Survey program. Um, and I'm comparing numbers. Yeah, that's another fun one that's fun for us. <laughs> yeah, that's so, so we have documents that say, you know, the population estimates is the official population measure. So if you need something that is the quote unquote official population measure, this is one, the one you have to use. And this one, this is how we come up with population estimates. It's using this cohort method uh, of taking population plus births minus deaths plus the net change in migration. Whereas ACS is a sample survey that is sent out to households and we, we do create, create the data that way. Um, so we have those comparison documents. We don't typically put them in press releases and other things like that because there's a perception that the, the audience of a press release is going to completely zone out if we start talking about nerdy things like sample design and methodologies and stuff like that. Um, so the documents are there to explain that those differences between those programs, they're just typically not put in a press release. But again, a point very well taken. I've heard it a number of times. Um, we're trying. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, Andy. This is Val Rice. Um, not a question, but a comment. I will add um, the the annual business survey. The non-employer statistics are really important, so I'll yeah. just kind of put a plug in for that as well for the annual business yeah. survey. And, and what I would say, and what I would ask of you is. Any kind of, uh, I'll use the term ammo, <laughs> any type of evidence that you can provide as a user to us of why that non-employer data being added back to ABS is important, what programs in Arizona are, are dependent on that type of data and without that data you then can't do A, B, and C. Anything like that that you all as users can provide us is very, very valuable because when we are working on expanding programs, um, ABS, um, we were able to do that survey because even with our budget cuts, we were still able to conduct the program by taking out non-employers. SBO was really expensive, as you can imagine, trying to sample employer businesses 7 million employer business in the U.S. is quite different than sampling 24 million non-employer businesses. So it's just the sample size is much larger. So, and it's really expensive to collect data from self-employed people. They, they aren't necessarily always the best respondents to surveys, and it takes a lot to, to collect useful data that, has, that meets our publication standards. But if there is evidence that you guys have of why you need that data, we could then use that when we then go to Congress and say, or the Department of Commerce and say, we need additional funding to add these data back into the survey because this is the types of uses that people need it for, and this is what they can't do in not having that data. So you all as users have a real voice in helping us make the case for data that we, that we want to collect.
any other questions? Okay, well, I'm, uh, I know I'm probably right at my, my time limit now. If you all think of anything uh, that comes up uh, to you, I have my email address and my phone number here on the screen. Uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, I, like Alan, have not been back in my office since March, uh, but my work phone number here on the screen does roll to my Census Bureau cell phone. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And with that, I think I am done. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I was just making sure my phone was, on, was not on uh, mute here. But thank you very much, Andy. Um, we really appreciate you uh, coming out and, and giving us the, this presentation. And uh, again, if anyone has any um, questions that they, they think of, you know, maybe later um, as you're thinking about this and, uh, you know, you come up with something, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out to Andy or, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, and, and feel free to reach out to me and I can get your question uh, to Andy and we can uh, get it uh, answered for you. Uh, thanks again, Andy. Um, we're going to, I guess, move on to our last uh, few minutes of our presentation, or I mean, of our uh, meeting. Um, I just thought that I would uh, go through um, some of the happenings uh, since our last meeting last year, um, just basically what the uh, state data center, the, uh, the uh, national program, and what we have done uh, as a state data center, um, you know, since that time, and just a, a few of the activities um, that we have, uh, you know, that, that, that we have done uh, nationally. Um, Barbara, I don't know, can you pass, I'm going to try to go on to my screen and uh, let me see, I'm going to try to, I'm just going to bring up our state. Okay. Okay. So if I think okay, I have okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And this should just be simple. Okay, good. Okay. So every, I'm just gonna go uh, through our State of the State of the Dates State Data Center uh, update for 2020. Um, the uh, just just uh, basic information about our state data center. Um, as I said previously, uh, we are the Arizona State Data Center Network. Um, we are currently uh, we consist of one lead agency, which is uh, the uh, the. Basically, we just call the uh, the agency here that is under the uh, State Demographers Office as our lead agency. Uh, we have four uh, coordinating agencies and uh, 23 affiliate agencies within our network. Um, the difference between a coordinating agency and an affiliate agency is that a coordinating agency has um, basically bigger uh, reach throughout the state, and that is why our uh, coordinating agencies consist of our three universities at uh, Arizona State University, the University of Arizona, and Northern um, Arizona University, mm -hmm. as well as our uh, Arizona State Library. Those are our four coordinating agencies. And uh, so our network totals uh, 28 agencies who are all involved in the dissemination of Census Bureau data and, you know, with other activities in partnership with the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. Um, every year we are asked as a state data center to give the U.S. Census Bureau a report of our activities for that 
calendar year, and I will normally put together a form that I will send to all of our member networks to um, give us a report of uh, you know what their activities are, and the the activities are basically um, given to us from the Census Bureau of what they're looking for. Um, but one of the main um, sections that they they ask us to um, provide is the uh, number of inquiries that folks call in to their areas for census data. And this, you know, this report in whole helps to um, continue to prove the program and, you know, so that the Census Bureau can provide uh, you know, funds to their inner office uh, division who uh, helps manage the national SDC program. Uh, no funds come to the state of Arizona or anything like that, but it is within you know, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, would be getting, you know, would be providing funds uh, within their um, their division to help to. Um, manage the program. So in Arizona for 2019, I believe the reporting um, happened in, uh, I think it was late December um, of 2019, I think, or, so, or somewhere between December and early January. Um, so for Arizona, we had a total uh, of 2,806 reported requests. Um, and those requests are divided uh, into a number of uh, different areas. Um, we had uh, 1,059 government requests, 282 business requests, 435 requests from, uh, for, uh, from academic or uh, research areas, um, 395 community-based nonprofit requests, 495 requests from private citizens, um, 62 requests from the media, and then 78 other requests um, that don't fit those categories. Um, and the thing that I've noticed over the years, um, you know, as, as the, requ the requests, um, you know, vary from year to year. Um, normally, after a census, you will, you know, and as we get new census data, you'll have a lot more requests than at the end of that 10-year period when you're, you know, getting ready to do a, um, you know, do another census. So, um, 2,806 requests probably doesn't seem like a, a whole lot, but, you know, we're at the very end of this data cycle and we're, you know, soon going to be getting new data. So I imagine that those requests will go back up. So if you're, um, you know, a member, you know, you can kind of expect that, you know, you may get more requests as we get the new census data and of people, you know, wanting to uh, learn about the data, learn how to use the data and, and so forth. And that's one of the, the primary uh, functions of having a state data center program um, within each state. So to the state data center programs, there's one within each state and also within each territory um, of the United States. So, uh, and it's all just a partnership uh, with the state and the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. And, um, you know, it's, it's an important uh, mission that we do. Um, you know, this census is, is, is um, an example of that as we have uh, been working a lot with the Census Bureau to try to make sure that uh, Arizona has the, uh, you know, the best uh, count that it can have and, and uh, that's one of our primary functions. So moving on, um, for our national program, um, we had a, you know, we, we talked about um, earlier uh, yesterday with uh, Ms. Pauline Nunez 
about you know what's been going on with the census campaign. Um, most of the state data center programs, or I should say all of the state data center programs um, throughout our nation have been working with the Census Bureau for their states to, you know, make sure that people understand how important the census is and um, how to respond to the census. And we're, you know, coming up to the end of our response period. Um, and that has been the primary focus of what most of the Census Bureau, I mean, whether most of the state data centers have been um, doing this time. Um, and so I won't go through, you know, what, you know, the, the, the different adjustment, adjustments. We know that, you know, we have had the pandemic, which caused delays in some of the operations, census operations. Um, and um, there's been some some other um, issues that have come up with that, but the the uh, campaign is still going forward. Um, we have um, deadlines that we're trying to uh, make sure that you know as many folks as we can get to respond. We're getting you know we're doing that. Um, we're working with the Census Bureau to um, to you know with them for their non-response uh, follow-up, um, you know, the parts that we can help them with. And uh, so uh, that is going forward. Um, the other thing uh, that happened in February uh, was that the National State Data Center Steering Committee had its elections. Um, I served on the State Data Center Steering Committee for uh, eight years, and I am now I have now turned turned out of the, the uh, National Steering Committee, so I'm no longer on that uh, committee. Um, however, they did have their elections in February, and uh, we had five candidates um, for the election: um, Alfred Sondera from Maryland, Walter Schwan from California. Mallory Bateman from Utah, Erica Gardner from Washington, and Greg Bell from Alabama. And there were three seats um, that were up for election. Um, the the National he has nine um, seats for folks on the National Steering Committee. Um, so every so there, so every year there's normally three seats that are up for uh, an election. Um, but if you are on the steering committee, you're supposed to be able to serve uh, two consecutive terms. Um, in my case, I came on um, as someone had resigned after their first year, so I served that person. serving for eight years. Um, so for our election results, we had three seats that were up, and the people that um, won election was Mallory Bateman, and she I think, to the steering committee, and she's from Utah. Uh, Greg Bell, this is his new, this is a new term for him, although he has served on the steering committee before, and then he, um, he served out his term and then he was out for a term. So he's uh, serving, basically this is a new term for him. And then uh, Erica Gardner, or, well, Greg's from Alabama, and then Erica Gardner um, from Washington State, and this is her new term. So um, those are the three new folks for the three folks who are who will be joining uh, the six others on the steering committee, and uh, they have been uh, working uh, for the state data center. Basically, the steering committee's function is to help administer the program uh, with the Census Bureau. Um, we work with the data users branch. Uh, and that program and uh, they've been doing um, a great job as, as uh, 
long as I've been uh, working in uh, this capacity since 2005. So I oh, I log them all. Um, let's see. We did have our National State Data Center Annual Conference in June, and and of course because of the the COVID uh, issues. It was a virtual meeting. Uh, this year's conference was, um, you know, it, it was virtual, and uh, so we had a uh, call-in session, which was three hours for each of the uh, three days that we met. It was June 16th, 17th, and 18th. Um, our topics that we went over included the 2020 uh, operational update where we, you know, talked about the uh, Census Bureau's uh, operations and what was going on at that time. Uh, we did a uh, an update on uh, what's going on with the redistricting. Uh, we talked about the poll surveys, which uh, and Andy talked about earlier. Uh, we, we did uh, get a review of the new micro, uh, micro data analysis tool, which we had uh, Kameen uh, talk to us yesterday about and show us how to use. Um, one of the really big to topics that um, Andy mentioned today, um, we weren't supposed to have a, a, a person speaking on it, but um, it is something that uh, at the, uh, within the demographer's office, the state demographer's office, we are uh, very intimately involved with, which was the, or which is the differential privacy, um, which is uh, a very important issue um, going forward that you'll probably be hearing about, um, you know, working with data. Um, so we, we got an update about that. Um, we did get an, an update about what's going on with the, um, you know, what the updates were for the American Community Survey. Um, we also did get um, a presentation uh, on the uh, Longitudinal Employment Household Dynamics Program, which we heard from earlier this morning. And, uh, you know, then we had our SDC national business meeting. Lastly, um, we had our Randy Gustafson Award. Um, Randy Gustafson was a person who uh, I knew early when I was on the steering committee. Um, Randy, um, unfortunately, uh, passed away while we were um, in committee um, in 2012, and Randy was a very important uh, person to the SDC, and um, so the National Network decided that we would thank uh, folks um, in his name, um, and so this award was awarded to Mr. Todd Graham, uh, who is the principal demographer for the Metropolitan Council of Minnesota. And Todd received us the award uh, for his outstanding work with the National Network um, and the Census Bureau and his leadership as the uh, past uh, chairperson for the State Data Center Steering Committee. So that's some of the uh, things that we had go on over um, since uh, our last meeting in December. Um, the steering committee continues to uh, work with the Census Bureau with all of the changes that's going on, as do all of the lead agencies. And uh, I think And uh, keep up the good work uh, as we, you know, await the uh, new data coming in uh, 2021 and 2022. So with that, 
I just want to thank everyone for attending our meeting uh, from yesterday and today. And uh, I just want to say that uh, we do on our website. Let's see if I can go to to be here. Yeah. On our uh, website, which can be found at azcommerce.com slash OEO slash population slash Arizona dash state dash data dash center dash SDC. And uh, we do have all of the presentations up. They can be found under the 2020 annual meeting, uh, I'm sorry, the 2020 virtual annual meeting pre presentations. So please be sure to check those out. Um, also, we did record both days. And so as soon as I have uh, both of those recordings, we will also um, try to get them up on our website. And I believe um, they will be going up. I'm not exactly sure um, where, but I can put something out on that once I find out. Um, but I will also, you know, try to get them up on our SDC site as well. Um, so, with that, do are there any questions that you have for me before we adjourn our meeting? With that. I can say um, our meeting is adjourned, and thank you all very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks. Hi, Alan. Thank you. Thanks. Be safe, everyone. Barb, how are we doing? We're doing good. Yay.